Hey, board gamers, BJ from Board Game Gumbo here, back with another episode of Gumbo Live. It's episode number 114, Gumbo Live, the number one Facebook Live talk show dedicated to board gaming. Our special guest tonight, Dr. Steve Finn of Dr. Finn's Games. We're going to be talking about his brand new Kickstarter and also some of the spicy hot games that we've played recently. Board Game Gumbo, a proud member of Punchboard Media. Check out some of our other fine members like Geekcraft, a blog written by Ken Grazier. Ken is a game demoer from Cleveland a long way away from Steve Finn's Hurricane, who you can see at friendly local game stores and conventions all over the country. He loves talking about games and helping people find the games that they will love. Punchboard Media, where we all bring something to the table. Hit us up on social media tonight, on Twitter or on Facebook, at Board Game Gumbo, and we'll be looking for your questions in the chat crew. But enough blather, guess let's get right to our special guest, Steve Finn. Welcome back to the show, man. Hello. <laughs> Welcome. Thanks for having me. So rumor has it you're at a waffle, an undisclosed Waffle House location somewhere outside of New York City. True? Not true? Um, I What's cannot, going on? I cannot disclose my exact location. I like it. <laughs> <laughs> but I will say this. I'm not at my house. The internet is down. And uh, true to form here, I had to come in and make sure that the job gets done. Anybody that questions a game designer's dedication to his craft, look at this. Steve this Finn from, from some undisclosed parking lot grabbing Wi-Fi. <laughs> well, but, let, you know, we're joking about the hurricane. We deal with those down here in the gumbo land. Uh, you guys are safe up there in your area of the country? Oh, yeah, it's totally safe. It, it, it's, not a, it's not even an issue of safety, generally speaking. It's just trees fall down. Yeah, there, it actually wasn't even that big of a storm today. But there was just a, all it takes is a few gusts, a tree falls down, and then the internet is out and the power's out for hours. Oh. Um, so that, I mean, that's really all it was. It was probably only 30 or 40 mile per hour winds. I've got oh, a, that's not too bad. I, got a, I just had to uh, take care of a mosquito. A mosquito. <laughs> that's a true, and you see, that's a true Louisiana hurricane. Hey, Thomas <laughs> Grieve, usually the first one, and he gets it tonight. He says, hello, everyone. Of course, Patrick Newman and Marshall Wells, mm -hmm. both of them are very familiar with hurricanes down here in Texas and Louisiana. Right. So. Thank God you're safe. But hey, give us the elevator pitch. Who is Dr. Steve Finn? And what is Dr. Dr. Steve Finn's game? What Dr. Finn's games? Uh, well, Dr. Finn's games is an independent publishing company uh, that publishes just my games. So really, it's just my company. Uh, and uh, it started, I don't know, 10, or 10, 12 years ago or so. I, I created a game, which is now called Biblios. Yellow contacted me to see if they could publish it. And then once my name got out there with that game, uh, I decided to pretty much go into self-publishing. Although I also work with other publishers and I'm, I am gonna have other games published and I have had games published with other people. But for the most part, it's, it's me uh, just making games that I wanna make. And generally speaking, the kind of games I make are um, quick strategic filler games. And I sometimes, you know, I'm, I'm a little hesitant to use the word filler because a lot of people think filler is like these very light games, but I, I tend to want to have games that are, even though they're quick and generally easy to understand, and they still really are trying to make you think so that every, every turn presents you with, you know, some really good agonizing decisions. You know, I'm a member of the Gateway and Filler Game uh, crew over there on Facebook, Chuck Yeager's group. I have no problem with the name Filler Games or Gateway Games. It, it serves yep. a purpose. It tells us what we are. In fact, Filler Games can actually fill up a whole night for us sometimes. I like Steve's term. Steve, uh, the name father, calls it tapas. And it's, tapas, it's those yeah. little bite-sized games that you have. And If you get a bunch of Filler Games in the, in the night and uh, they all have crunchy things, and if anybody hasn't played Biblios, Doc, you know that it, that is not just a roll of dice and and uh, you know, play however you want. It's a crunchy, thinky game in a bite-sized package. So that's pretty cool. I do have a I do have a question for you. There's a there's a post going around on the internet today about what to do when a review isn't so good. You know, I don't design games. Yeah, Steve, how how do you handle it when you see those 
You know the ones on BGG yeah. or on Reddit. Yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah. I have I have plenty of bad reviews. I mean, there'll be a bad review. I to be honest, I don't get a lot of bad reviews from like established reviewers. But what I might do is I'll go look at you know on board game geek. I mean, occasionally I'll get a bad review. Uh, I, I won't say that, but I won't say I never get them. But when I do get one, you know, I'll 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 listen and I'll say I'll ask it. You know, do I think it's fair? Or do I not think it's fair or whatever? Um, I try not to be defensive. And, you know, because I recognize not every game is for everybody. You know, sometimes I feel like maybe they've gone a little too far in their criticism, like uh, where I, where it's almost offensive. Mm, yeah. <laughs> but I just try to ignore trolling. that. Trolling. Yeah, it's kind of like trolling, you know, or there's a lot, you know, like Biblios, when it first came out, there's a lot of people who just hate it. I mean, there's a I, the vast majority of people love it, but you know, there's that tiny minority uh, who write a lot of very negative things on it, uh, and they're like, "I don't understand why so many people love this so much," you know, blah blah blah. So, what do you do? I, I mean, my advice is to listen for the honest criticism, and you'd make a decision: do you agree or not? I mean. You know, Tom Bassel just recently, I like Tom and I appreciate, I, I do like his opinions. You know, he really got into me for my recent game, School of Sorcery's art, saying it was very generic. And I, I think it's true that it was generic, but I found it, I found it interesting of how negative he, he took it. I mean, it's, I don't think it's bad art, <laughs> but the way that he spoke about it, he loved it. He said the game was great, uh, just thought the art was bad. And, you know, I, I had, to, I took that, I was like, ah. Is he right? Is he not right? You know, and then I went, looked back at the art and I'm like, yeah, the cover is not great, I admit. And so I'm like, yeah, the cover is generic. But I think the art in the actual game itself is is pretty good. And yes, I admit it's generic, but it's still like colorful and bright. There's a lot of games out there right now, which is what I consider to be just ugly art. You know what I mean? Just ugly. Yeah. And your games are slowly moving over to even more and more beautiful art. But it, And it sounds like you, you're kind of taking to heart what some people say. So your best yeah. advice in a small bite would be don't take it personal. Learn from the things that you think are honest criticism and ignore ignore the trolls. Ignore the rest. Yeah. <laughs> Go with your gut. I mean, you know, you know what kind of game you make. You know Tom who you're trying to appeal to and go with it. Yeah. Thomas, you're killing us. He says he's got his copy of School of Sorcery, but he has yet to get it to the table. I don't know if you can see the comments. Yeah, I, I can see the Thomas, but I say, why are you watching me? <laughs> Stop. Open up the game and go play it. Go play. <laughs> Forget about watching me. You know what? We could just you could just teach him the game right now if you want. But no, let's sure, get back. Okay, to you. you roll the dice. Verla <laughs> says there's a difference between reviewing a game and giving a respectful opinion and just taking out your anger in life on the first target you find. Yeah. That's a good point. Hey, here's a here's a great review. I have yet to play a bad Steve Finn game. That's what Dean says. Dean, give me back my microphone. Get it out of the Jello, man. He's got. You <laughs> he put my microphone in the Jello again. Well, I appreciate Dean, uh, Dean for you know he's he's playing all my games too. I just keep sending him stuff. He, I, I'm sending him stuff now. Uh, if it's the Dean uh, of Meeple, yeah, Town, it's right? from Meeple Town. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, I'm just sending him things. He doesn't even know they're coming. <laughs> well, there it is, Dean. I just got you two more games. <laughs> Hey, th there's a rule in Louisiana, and I don't know if you guys have it in New York. It's the Waffle House meter. So if the uh, Waffle House is still open, the weather's not that bad. You'll be okay. So that, yeah, that's yeah. how we kind of judge it down here. So, And uh, Patrick Newman says uh, he bets you're not at a Whataburger, and he's probably right about that. I don't know if there's any Whataburgers up there. Huh? Never heard of it. <laughs> okay. So uh, let's talk about some hey, spicy hot Shake game. Shacks. That's what we have. <clears throat> Shake Shacks I have eaten at the uh, in Indianapolis at Gen Con. Remember that convention that they used oh, to have over yeah, in yeah. Indianapolis? Yeah, <laughs> Gen Con. Uh, never been. BJ from Morgan Gumball. Oh, really? Oh, okay. Yeah. Well, you know, you're not really missing anything this year. So yeah. don't. <laughs> Dean says he's ready. He's getting a new one tomorrow. All right. Oh, what good. happened to your face there, Dean? Oh, there he is. He's popping in now. All right. So, um, BJ from Morgan Gumbo, I've got my guest here, Dr. Steve Finn. Steve Finn from, from Dr. Finn's Games. And we're talking spicy hot games, although Thomas says, Dr. Finn keeps sending me games as well. He just charges. <laughs> yes. Hey, you know like what, Tom? It. Thomas, I, that's yeah, how he stays in business. I, I usually don't send it until, unless he pays first. So. Right. You gotta <laughs> we're talking spicy hot games. And one of the ones I wanted to talk to you about is a, is a game that uh, Tim sent me from, uh, from Thunderworks Games 
lockup. It's in the role uh, player universe. Now you're familiar, yeah. I'm sure, with the role player universe. I have played role player. Okay. I have not played lockup. Okay, so forget what you know about role player. It's okay. the universe. It's the same artwork. It's the same, you know, story and the same uh, type of place. But yeah. the game is not the same. Right. As you can see, unlike role player, it's got this big giant board. Yep. There's an argument over the internet. Is it a worker placement game? Is it a bidding game? I think it's kind of a meld between the two. But basically, you've got those spots on the board, the green, the blue, the yellow, and the red, and the orange. Yeah. And the gray and the purple. Though, Except for the purple one, you're going to be placing out workers with different powers on them. Okay? Yeah. And you can put some of them secret. That's the twist in the game. You can put oh. some of them face down. Two in a three, four, five player game. Three nice. in a two-player game. So yeah. you know that little secret bidding thing. That's that's yeah. a yeah. That's one that you like. This is these are the workers that you have. Right. If you're the, if you're the blue uh, goblins, yeah, goblins. I think um, you'll have. I, by the way, you're a music fan, right? Uh, by what? Settle Wait, a bet. Do I Let's... like music? <laughs> yeah. Uh, so, no. No. I hate no. He I can't stand he, it. He just like white noise <laughs> in the background. So settle a bet. Are the top three? Did they model them after Green Day? Carlos, Carlos is convinced that those are that's the, the three people from Green Day. Uh, I'm not know, sure. That top guy, I don't really, I know the music of Green Day, but I don't know what they look like, but that's what I imagine that they would look like. I know the guy, you know, the lead singer doesn't have right. big, big hair like that. Yeah, I, don't know, but I don't know about the other two. I don't know. And, and that does. nose looks familiar too. It looks familiar. All right. So the, uh, so. out there on those worker placement boards, you're going to be placing those workers secretly. You yes. can spend as much as you want or as little as you want in each space. But once you go into space, that's your only bid. Okay. Right. And yep. each of those spaces are going to do something a little bit different. So you've got the left side spaces there. Those are going to give you resources. The greens, right. the blues, and the silvers. There, there's something in there, scrap and potions and something else. The red one is going to give you power tokens, which means one of your workers, he actually grows during the game. He or she will get more powerful the more red cubes you get. So that and it also grabs a start player. And by the way, start player token breaks all ties. So it becomes very important because there's lots of ties in this game. Then yeah. the other three spots or the other the, the one at the top is just giving you something, uh, an extra resource. But the other three spots are where the where the game shines. You're going to take those workers. One of them is going to get you these items. Items not only score you points, but they also give you secret little benefits there at the top left. That could be more power cubes, getting rid of suspicion. Hey. If you're locked up and you're trying to get all this contraband, the guards are going to eventually notice, right? So when you go and you talk to certain goons, there's going to be suspicion by grabbing that stuff. And whoever gets too much suspicion is going to lose points anytime there's a raid. So we're trying not to get suspicion, but we're trying to get these cool things. There's the goons I was talking about. These are also going to get you points. Um, I don't want to mention a, a certain game that a certain designer showed me where you collect sets as you're walking through something. You know the game I'm talking oh, yeah, about, Stephen? Yes, yeah. Yes. yeah, Sim yeah. Similar here. You're collecting dwarves to try to get lots of points. You're collecting bandits to try to get points. Some of them actually match up to each other, like the uh, dwarves. You want to get a, You want to get seven dwarves, right? Ah, okay. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> that was kind of a cool inside joke there. But yeah. this is your game board. That's where you're keeping the resources at the top. There's that power that you have. And you know, there's five different players in it. It's got all right. this cool artwork. Lockup. Here's the thing that you have to understand about lockup. And that's that's where I love the game, but I can't recommend it for everybody. I'll recommend it for almost everybody. But if you don't like player interaction, those spots on the board, when you're placing things down, upside down, when you're playing cards out of the library that steal resources or, or move you ahead of the line or do yeah. things like that, there's a lot of player interaction in this game. It's it's uh, Alex Goldsmith played well, it with me last it, night, and he said it's one of the one of the meanest euros he's ever played. So, well, there's I a little difference, bit the, right? Can I ask, is there a, ask a question? Yeah, sure. Yeah, is is it player interaction or is it take that? Because to me, that that's different. You can have a lot of player interaction without it necessarily being uh, really mean, or or can it? Actually, that's an interesting question I just raised. It's a little, uh, yeah, <laughs> exactly. interesting design philosophy, right? It's it's a little of both. 
there's yeah. a little bit of you know passive aggressive because right. I see that Steve's got a three there. I'm yeah. gonna secretly put a four behind him and he doesn't right. know that, right? Right. Or I bluff him and I put something face down and he doesn't know I'm just putting a two and right. he thinks I really want it. So right. indirectly, there's also some limited player interaction because of those library cards. When you get those purple cards, some of them will increase things for you, which is is indirect, or it directly does something. It steals the start player token from Steve Finn, or mm. it it steals power cubes from Verla. So right. yeah, there's there's some direct player interaction. But I think the meanness is it, the library cards are limited because you can only get a few of them. The meanness comes in when you're playing those characters down, and you know you know that you've got the tie and your opponent is just going all in and they think they've won it and they, they have no idea that you have just crushed them. So, right. but you know what a game that takes, you know, 60 minutes to 70 minutes, you're not investing a two or three hour game or a six hour game like twilight Imperium. It, heck we played this game back to back one night. So, yeah. it, you know, it, it plays really breezy and really quick. If as long as it's breezy and quick like that, I don't mind. I don't mind a little bit of meanness. In fact, yeah, it's let's face it. It's part of the part of some games. The fun is being a little bit mean to each other, right? As long as it's justified. Yeah, yeah. I, I avoid games like that generally, unless you're mean to everybody. I don't like games in which you pick on where you can be mean to one person. So if the cards like have oh this affects everybody negatively, then I like that. Now, if you happen to be in the same region as someone and right. because of the circumstance, you're targeting them. But yeah, I'm 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 not a fan at all of games where you can pick one person and target them. Like yep. steal steal a gem from whatever player you want. I hate that. Can't stand it. Yep. So this yeah. one uh, this one eliminates most of that stuff. It's it's directly related yeah. to you getting the benefit, not I'm just gonna sabotage Steve because it doesn't make sense, you know. The, because of the way right. the points are working and everybody's collecting, I guess you could math it out if you really want to. But you know, you're talking about seventy to one hundred and twenty points. It's hard to math out every single little situation. So, in the, at least in all the games I've played, every time we've been mean to each other, it's yeah. limited. It's like I really need this space, so Steve, right. I'm knocking you out. Uh, right. More like a Carson City than what you're describing, where you're going directly for that space. You're not just yeah. playing Kingmaker and saying. Oh, I don't want Steve to win, so I'm going right, to do this right. to him. You're, yeah, you're, everybody's still in it to the end. In right. every round, you still feel like, oh, man, if I get one more card, I'm shooting right up to the top. So I, I don't see that happening in this game. I don't think it's got that level of mean. The meanness comes in, oh, man, you, you put in all this effort in this one little burst. It's not like, oh, I've been working on it all game. This one little burst and somebody punctures your balloon. If yeah. you don't mind puncturing other people's balloons, I think this game is a good fit. But right. It flew into the radar. I mean, I, this is a really well designed, really solid game by Stan uh, Kordonsky, and uh, kudos to Thunderworks. I, I really enjoyed it. So, I'll, but I'll, again, I'm not recommending it to people that will get butt hurt about too much player interaction. How old is this game? Just came out last year. Oh, last year. Right. Yeah. So it just kind of it came out at the same time as Cartographers, and I think that Cartographers was such a hit that it, this one kind of just didn't get that publicity. So okay. I finally got a chance to play it, and I really liked it. BJ from More Game Gumbo, I've got my guest here, Dr. Steve Finn from Steve from Dr. Finn's Games. I don't know why I keep saying that. And you've got a game that you've played that I have not gotten to play, and I'm super curious about what uh, you think of it. It's called Foundations of Rome. If I remember right, it's an Emerson Matsuchi design. Yeah, I Arcane Thunder. Tell me about it. What's the elevator pitch? I Well, uh, what's the elevator? Or what's it about? Uh, yeah, well, what's it about? Yeah, uh, well, it's, a, it, it's an interesting game. You are uh, The main thing you're trying to do is – build up uh your buildings so you have everybody has a set of different types of buildings i mean i, I played it a couple weeks ago so hopefully i can remember the main idea of it you you're trying to put different types of buildings out there and the buildings score for sometimes for what they are but then for what other types of buildings they're next to and it could be your own or it could be other people and the way you get your buildings out there is there's a grid Right, and you could see at the top of the picture here that there's like uh, coordinates on the like top, F9, top right? C1, D2, yeah. So what you do is, you know, like a typical game where you could buy a card, the card on the left is the least expensive, and then when you buy one, they slide over. You're basically buying these plots of land. Um, maybe it's similar a little bit like New York 1901, where you're picking Ooh, a plot, yeah where you're picking up plots of land, but the mechanism for choosing those plots is different. 
In this case, you're like, for example, I could, I could say I want that C1. I take the C1 card, I put like my little worker on there. And when I get the workers that are in the shape, they're like Tetra shapes of one of my buildings, I can replace my workers with that building. Ah. And then I either might score points or gold or, you know, points and gold uh, and, and stuff like that. And it, it's interesting because you can overbuild. So if I had a shape, for example, like a square, but then I, or well, the square is the biggest one, but if, let's say I have a straight piece that's three, three squares long. Okay. If I can get that fourth square next to it, I can then remove my three, my three square building and put down my four square building. That's similar so, to New York 1901 a little bit too, where you can, is. you can build to that next level. Yeah, so it's this is actually a very it's very simple game. It's just on your turn, you just buy a card, put your worker down, and then if you can, you replace your workers with one of your shapes. And that and if that's basically what mechanically that's basically what's happening. But there's enough interesting um, play, you know. There's enough interesting decisions in the way the buildings interact with each other to try to squeeze them down. And then also just trying to fight over the space with other people. See here, there's not direct conflict. It's just like grabbing the card before someone else. Like, okay. oh, you know, I really want that card. And then someone else grabs it. Um, so you're, you're kind of playing on your own board, basically. No, during the game. no, no, you're no? not playing on your own board at all. You oh, have your own off. board of pieces that you're taking off okay. and putting on the main board, but we're competing over the main board. Um, what do you okay. think about the production? You know, the pictures that I've seen make this game look amazing. I cannot tell you about the production because I played it online. Oh, you played it online. Okay. I played this online. Okay. Now, obviously, yeah, it looks really nice. The pictures online, there was one thing that slightly annoyed me was that the your own color is not obvious. Like they, let me see. The, the buildings are the same colors. Like everybody has the same white and gray because that's a difference between, if I recall, like places which are municipal and then civil or I don't know. I can't remember oh. what the second one is. And then on top of those buildings, there's like a little marker that has your color, like a small square. Now, I don't know if in person that's obvious. But, you know, I would have thought with this production, it would have been nice to have like a ring, you know, like where it's your whole color on the outside oh. that really makes it stand out or or the windows are painted your color. Um, so that's a very, I mean, that's a tiny minor thing, but with like the overall production, I'm saying, I would just say, oh, I, it would have been nice if they did that too. But it's a really cool, I mean, I think it's a great game. Um, it's, I mean, it's, it's a massive box with a lot of pieces. And, you know, that's personally, though, that's not my thing. Like, I would really like this game, but I'd have a, I'd never pay, I'll never buy a game for more than $50. Ooh, I just, I, that. Yeah. I know, I, I won't. No matter how much I like a game, I just won't buy it because the way that I play games is I play a lot of new games constantly. And I, like, I rarely play the same game. So if I bought that, it would go on my shelf. Maybe I'd play it like two or three times and then that would be kind of it. Um, so like so to me, have, when I- You'd have been okay when, with half the production quality and making it a $50 game. Oh, I, I would, yeah, I'd be happy. I would really, if this game was a $50 game and instead of having all of these pieces just had uh, nice thick tiles like Carcassonne, thick right. you know, you know, or any any number of games yeah. that have tired. But tiles like that, that, that would have been fine with me. You know who did that? Um, um, in the game High Rise, yeah, Gil, Gil. Ho yeah, Gil Hova at first had one of the big plastic pieces because of the way it just looked amazing on the table. I saw a lot right. of pictures. Right, it didn't fun, and he came back with putting more Quan Chi Mori art on standees and said, and and actually, uh, yeah. Draft Mechanic was talking about it the other night. They actually loved the art on the standees instead. So you got right. you got the price point that you would like. You still have the same good gameplay, and you still got great art. So, yeah, I, I think they, I think this appeals to a certain gamer that does like the beautiful pieces. Hey, I, I'm one of those. I've upgraded all my New York 1901 legendary buildings. I have them all as the big, giant plastic pieces. Yeah, just this is just because they look cool on the table. That doesn't add to the gameplay at all. But um, right, 
you know, it's yeah, I'm not, I'm not, that's not me, you know, <laughs> but I, I, I don't look down on you. You know, yeah, like, yeah, there's sure. a lot of, there's a lot of people who are very adamant about all the minis and stuff that are on Kickstarter and really hate it. But I just say, obviously, if, if they're selling millions of dollars and, you know, getting millions of dollars, there's people that want it. Right. There it, I is. Mean, there it is. So that's foundations yeah. room. You give it um thumbs up, but uh, oh, not I, a, no, no, I, a big thumbs up. Big thumbs up. I well, it, I mean, I give it a, as a game. Big thumbs up on the game. I can't tell you whether it's worth uh, whatever hundred it is for the production quality, but as far as the actual game goes itself, it's a thumbs it's up. a it's a good, solid you know gateway game. Wow. Back yeah. to back games. Oh, th yeah. Thumbs up from me for lock up, and a thumbs up from you for in what is it called? It's um, Foundations of Rome. Foundations of Rome from Emerson yeah. Matsuchi and Arcane Wonders. Yeah. Hey, Patrick Newman's got a question for you. Are you opposed uh, to knowingly blocking an opponent's route in Ticket to Ride, as an example? All right. So the the doctor, by the way, is I have a PhD in philosophy. So sure, as, sure. as soon as I read a question, you know, I'm going to nitpick it apart. Yeah. What does it mean? Uh, so opposed to do i like it when people do that no i don't like it when people do that do i think that it's a legitimate thing to do if you're trying to win yes um but i wouldn't do it in a game usually unless i'm playing someone that i know like is kind of a mean player or who has done something mean to me <laughs> i'll do it right back but you know like my brother when i play with my brother he doesn't play a lot of games but yeah there's been times where it's like clear I'm going, you know, like I have two routes that are kind of going at each other. Meeting right in the usually not the thing you want to do in Ticket to Ride and, and give people that idea. But sometimes that's what you have to do. And I got like that one piece that just connects them. And he'll just like put one little piece down. Uh, man, I always think in terms of chess, man, I want to I want to get the middle of the board because that's exactly what I'm afraid of. I'm trying to do this 20 pointer and I'm missing right. that one little stretch near St. Louis. I want to make sure I get that done. So, uh, yeah, so Patrick, he says not he wouldn't knowingly block unless unless I mean, you needed it for the win, though, Doc. Right, Steve? I mean, if, if you need. Oh, yeah. It yeah. No, I mean, I'm not opposed to doing it. Right. I personally don't like that aspect of the game that that occasion arises that people can do that. There's a lot of games where you could purposely do something just to harm one other player. And I think like in a four player game, I don't like it when that happens. So my, it's not like it's a flaw. Like I don't necessarily see it as a flaw with the player. I actually see it as a flaw in a sense with the game sometimes, you know? PJ more game gumbo. I've got my guest here, Steve yep. Finn from Dr. Finn's games. We're talking some of the spicy odd games. The last one I want to talk about is one I haven't played, but boy, I had my eye on it. And me and Johnny Pack went back and forth talking on social media about it. It's Paris, if I remember right, designed by Michael Kiesling and yeah, Kramer. Kramer. Yeah. yeah, yeah. So another Kramer and Kiesling match up together. They, you know, you know, there's a ton of games out there that they they play. Right. In fact, some of my favorite games uh, are from those from that design crew. So you've played Paris. Tell us about I, it. I, I played it online. So my my uh impressions of this have to be taken with that in context the idea i i love this idea of this game and for the first hour and a half i enjoyed it after an hour and a half though i got to the point where i was like i don't want to do this anymore and i just started making decisions simply to get it done now in my opinion, there's some thinky games, you know, like where there's just so many things that you could do. Um, it's not like the, the basic game has a, a ton of different things that you can do. It's fairly simple. You just place a key in one of the regions and, and, it's, and it's good. But then this outside wheel, they have all these cards on it and each one is a different action. And, and the way the, the mechanic works is you can move your guy when you get to take that action. You can move your guy to any one of those spaces on the wheel, which is neat, but you can't go backwards. So once you pass something, you're past it. So this is one really interesting thing about the game, but it's also one thing that just drives me nuts because if you are playing with anybody subject to analysis paralysis, they have to look at every single one of those cards and mm. you could just be sitting there thinking about how far ahead do I want to go? What does each card do? You know, and there's that, but also the game lasts uh, 
And I don't think it's just because it was on long. It was just one of these things where I feel like for the interestingness of this game, I think it lasts too long. It overstayed it, its welcome. It just overstayed a welcome. But if it ended, like if it was just shorter, this would be an amazing game. It's it's a really neat, like area, it's got area control. It's gonna get this, I think the wheel, if they took out the wheel on the outside, it might be a less interesting game, but it would then be a strictly area control kind of game in the middle. And uh, there's a couple neat mechanisms in it. Um, Could it be partly due to the fact that online, we've noticed that some of our online games are a little longer. And in fact, Thomas Grieve wants to know, do you prefer Tabletopia or Tabletop Simulator from that regard? Yeah, it's funny. Uh, it's it's strange. I I think tabletop, tabletop Simulator, in my opinion, just usually functions better. It doesn't seem to freeze as much. Right. But I actually think that if Tabletopia, if if their program or whatever it is ran smoother, I actually think it's more intuitive. It also doesn't have as much functionality, but I feel like it's just more intuitive and it's it's like easier to move around in and to pick up things and, and stuff, but it's so slow. I feel less like I'm playing a computer program and more like I'm playing a board game when I play Tabletopia. Yes, there's so much more functionality on Tabletop right. Simulator. I wish some of that would get into Tabletopia, but I played a game uh, Connor to Connor McGoy told us um, City Builder, and I'll tell you, it was so smoothly designed, so smoothly designed that it felt like we were right there at the table, just moving stuff around and playing. Yeah, as close as you can get in in a digital age. I mean, it's not obviously playing at the table, but Gil's Gil's game the other day that we played, Rival Networks, it was it was he actually got Tabletopia to do it, so it was so smooth and so streamlined, everything just made sense, you know. Yeah. Uh, not all the tabletopia builds are like that. Aquatica, man, that's a rough one. There, you know, cards get stuck under the board or get stuck underneath uh, playing piece things, and you're trying to move them around. So, not everyone is quite built as smooth. But if it's a well, smooth build, it's good. Yeah, yeah. Do you know what the games that work really well on tabletopia? What's that? Uh, Doctor Finn's School of Sorcery. Ah, <laughs> Doctor <laughs> Dr. Finn's Little Flower Shop. Doctor yeah. Finn's Manga Parbat and Doctor Finn's Mining Colony. All work great. Um, well, let's let's get to those right now. <laughs> well, we're going to bring in uh, Verla to help us out on some of these games. And one of the ones, hey, BJ from Morgan, I've got my guest Steve Finn, and of course Verla. What's up, Verla? Oh, hi, Verla. We forgot to turn the mic on. Hey, try it now, Verla. Hey, can you hear me now? There's, we're talking some spicy games that Doctor Finn's got, and he's got a Kickstarter coming up. What's the details on that Kickstarter coming up pretty soon? August. Yeah, August 24th. And it's a four game Kickstarter for my whole 2021 line of games. Well, the first one I've got is Biblios Quill and Parchment. Tell us all about it, Steve. All right. So, uh, for those of you who are not familiar, uh, Biblios it was my first uh, game, really, that uh, made it in the world. And that is a game, it's a card game about. Uh, monks being scribes. Um, then I had a Biblios Dice game, which uh, came out, and now this is the third in a in the series. And this is a roll and write, and it's got markers with dry erase. It's got nice wooden dice, um, and the the basic idea is you are a medieval scribe. Uh, also, this game I tried. I I got a lot of criticism for the lack of thematic integration with Biblios. But this game, I really tried to make it more thematic and I succeeded, although it's still, I mean, you know, it's still a a, a loosely themed game. Hey, but at least, go, yeah, this, go ahead. The pictures that we're showing, that's from Kevin Russ, right? Yes, who, who uh, is a photographer, nature photographer, but he's also a game designer. Absolutely, uh, Kevin Cal Calico. Calico, absolutely, played it and I'm waiting on my copy to come in. I actually backed the game. Um, Kevin taught us it at uh, Gen Con last year. But what I was going to say about the pictures is these are the final components, what we, what we should be seeing, or this is a pre-production. What are we looking at? All right. Yeah. What you're saying. Yeah. So, yeah. So I have, uh, I have pre-production samples made that are basically the same quality as a final production uh, with the exception that I, I'll look through it, you know, like the rule book has a lot of mistakes in this version that I need to correct. And as I get all the dice, I'll look at things and I'll be able to make some adjustments. Um, 
but the actual quality here is is very high. It's not just like a prototype, but it's. Did we miss an opportunity, Steve, to have actual quills and ink wells for the roll and write? That's a good point from Thomas. That's a good one. <laughs> yeah, we we may have. I didn't know how to do how to how to get away with it with the uh, dry erase quill marker. <laughs> that would be funny. <laughs> All right, so how do you how do you play quill and parchment? All right, so it, here's how you play. It's the, there's it's broken up into rounds. There's uh, eight days divided into two periods. And like in, in Biblios, the first half of the game, which is four of those days, four rounds, you are essentially kind of acquiring uh, things. Mostly you're acquiring uh, books. Well, you're not acquiring. What you're technically doing is copying. So there's some book dice that have one of five different books on them. And uh, you'll be collecting those. And then there's a couple dice that give you Abbott influence. So if you're familiar with Biblios, Sure. Uh, Abbott influence is basically replacing gold. Oh, okay. So rather than a monk collecting gold and then spending it at an auction, what you're doing here is you're accruing influence with your abbot, who's in charge of the monastery. And then in the second half of the game, you're using that accrued influence to kind of uh, influence him to give you the chores to, to be able to copy the books that you want. So that's one way that I've kind of thematically tied it in. So you've got some book dice and you have influence dice and then you have this thing called the travel die. And so you have a little map. I don't know if you could see it here, but each player's card has a map. Oh, and, is that the, uh, in that upper? upper yeah, it's, it's kind of like in the, the middle. Table. It's in the middle of the upper middle of it. Yeah, I see it. And uh, you send your novice out and he travels along and he picks up uh, books along the way. And if he goes to different towns where he'll do good works in the different towns, you'll score points to, depending on how far he travels. So everybody has their own set of dice. And what happens is a lot of simultaneous action in this game. So um, one really good thing that I would say about the game is that there's very, very little downtime. Oh, so no. everybody rolls their dice at the same time. And you get you get up to three rolls. But the, but the slight change from like a normal Yahtzee thing is everybody decides at the same time whether they're going to roll all their dice again roll exactly one or roll none. So you don't okay. just like pick, I'm gonna pick these two. You have to say, I'm gonna roll them all, one or none. And you'll go like, none, you'll point to one. <laughs> there we go. Right, right. Right. <laughs> you'll point to one that you wanna re-roll or you'll say, roll them all. After everybody rolls, stops rolling, you know, everybody stops rolling, then they'll mark their sheets and there is a little interaction because in the main board, there's a thing called a chapel. So this really is an interaction, but on the main board where the dice are to the right, you, you have a chapel. And uh, if you get chapel dice, you're allowed to move closer to the altar. Uh, and that's gonna be used for a lot of tie breaking scenarios throughout the game. So whoever's closer to the altar, moving up the track furthest towards the altar is in, you know is ahead for ties. Um, so in the first half, you're accruing influence, your, your guy is moving out in the world and you're copying books. And in the second half of the game, if you're familiar with Biblios, you know that the, there's five different categories of things. In right. this game, there's five different types of books. You know, it's like religion. So this is where th thematically it came in better too. It's like religion, philosophy, astronomy, herbals, which are books about herbs that medieval priests used to write about, and bestiaries, which are books about fantastic beasts. So you're collecting those, and those have different values. And so the, the more valuable it is, obviously, the more of those books you want. And those values are shown on the main board with the dice. And the dice start off where religion is the most valuable because it is a monastery. So unlike Biblios, where they all start off equal, in this game, the dice are different. Mm -hmm. So the value of the different categories are laid off. One is worth four, two are worth three, and two are worth two. So now right at the start, you know that some things are more valuable than others. Um, and then the second half of the game, and this is where I don't know if uh, this is unique or not, but does anyone out there in, you know, in the audience or one of you two know, is there a roll and write game that has auctions? Because... I this this one, one does. <laughs> what? So oh. In the second half, 
put it on Sheldon, man. We could just yeah, hit there we go. And find so out. in the second half of the game, uh, the dice it? that everybody rolls gets put now on the main board, and then what we're going to do is use the Abbott influence that we did, uh, that we accrued in the first half, to bid for groups of dice that are you know freshly rolled every round, and you're bidding for a group of dice and a special power that comes along with each group, um, and then. In that second half of the game, whoever wins the embellishment die each round can manipulate the values of the categories. Um, and uh, that's where there's a similarity with the original game of Biblios. So uh, it's a quick game, 30, you know, like 30 minutes. It could be probably with two people. It could be even done in like 15 to 20 minutes. Um, but, you know, I, I believe it has a lot of thinkiness in it. And, you know, there's... The, the interaction is obviously in the auction, but the auction is, it's a one-shot auction that's secret. So I guess you're not bidding, you know, you don't hear what other people are gonna bid. So you, uh, but also the, the influence at the end is worth points, so you have to kind of be careful about how much uh, you spend. And Burley, you've played this, right? Yeah, so I play tested it. Um, Dr. Ben and my family, and we all really liked it. I'm. Roll and Reds are kind of growing on me, but this was one that I was like, I cannot wait to back this. Truly, it was really fun. And I, I think it's been about maybe two months since we did the play test. Yeah, it's been about two months, I think. You're talking yeah. about it. I'm getting excited all over again. <laughs> and really liking where the artwork is going too. Yeah, tell me about the artist. This is a, I love the I love the cover, man. All right, Kevin oh, yeah. Russ. This uh this is someone I just found. Uh, her name is Aka Holzabos. Um, sweet. Uh, where, uh, I forget where she's from. Uh, uh, Not in New York. Yeah, you know, it's, it's Scandinavian country, I okay. believe. Anyway, uh, found her online, um, and she's uh, she did this. She also did the artwork for the butterfly garden for me. Oh, um, we'll talk about that next. Yeah, it's uh, it's an interesting. You know, she helped me make some decisions too. There's some. I think the artwork is very interesting when you start looking at it closely, um, especially the player cards have a lot of little things going on there. Um, but she, you know, she made, she helped me make the decision about what kind of dice and she suggested using wood dice. And, uh, I was surprised. I've never actually had wood dice in a game. I didn't realize how, how light they are. Have they you ever are played light. a game with, oh, man, they are so light. And I, Talk I didn't realize the benefit of it. Like, oh my God, this is going to help the shipping costs. Yeah. Really go down. But Talk I didn't think of that. That wasn't the reason I did it. It was because I actually... I was like, oh, it could be nice because the theme, you know, it's like, I don't know, it's like the natural wood of it, the yeah. medieval. It seems to fit well, um, but it also leads to, and this is, some people might not like it, but when when uh, the ink is being put into the wood and also the wood, because it's, it's a lot of it is natural color, there's variation between the colors. So like one wooden block isn't necessarily exactly the same as the other. So it might have actually a little bit, it might seem a little imperfect at times, but I kind of like that. And also when the ink goes in, sometimes it seeps out a little, like it's not as as precise Ooh. as in a resin dye. And it makes it look almost like unfinished, hmm. but I don't mind that. Like I got the dice, I'm like, oh, wow, that's interesting. You know, there's perfect circles here, but then this one's just a little off, you know? And that kind and, of fits the theme of this being a medieval, it's an old uh, game, Exactly. Right? So, you know, I was trying to decide if that was a good thing or not. And I, I'm I'm going to say it is. <laughs> so Dean said, it sounds cool. I'm always a bit reluctant to play anything that's game I love, the dice game. But Steve, I'm not getting that. This seems like you tried to bring out the thematic feeling of Biblios, but a new game, right? Yeah. This is not, I mean, the only thing that is really the same in this is the fact that it's divided into two halves. So I'd say that these are the similarities. There's two halves, there's five categories, and there's auctions. Mm -hmm. Other than that, it's a very different game. You know, the, the, the feeling that you get in this game is nothing like Biblios. You know, there's not as much psychological stuff going on in this game. I think in Biblios, there's a lot of psychological stuff you know, what did they get rid of? You know, like you're not, sure. the only psychological guessing you have here is 
what do you think the other person's going to bid and what uh, in the second half of the game, what are they going to try to go for? Um, so it's a very different feeling game. It's not, I'm not trying to capture Biblios the same thing. Otherwise it uh, like, w why do it? If it's not going to be a different game, then why make a dice game? And that's Biblios quill and parchment coming to Kickstarter August 25th. Is that right? 24th. 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 All right, thanks. Be there on day one. Be there on day one. That's right. Yes. <laughs> BJ from Wargame Gumbo. I've got my guest here, Dr. Steve Finn from Dr. Finn's Games, and we're talking about some of the spicy games he's got coming out on this big joint Kickstarter on August 24th. The next one up in line, The Butterfly Garden. I think you said a similar artist to Biblios Quill and Parchment. Is that right? A a identical artist, yes. Very, the that's same. Right. That's right. one and the same person. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. So, so tell us about the game. What is Butterfly Garden? I'll just mention this right off the top. I'm changing the background color of that art on the on the box. It was just too much yellow. See, that's where you get an advanced copy, and you're like, oh boy. So that's <laughs> going to be blue. Just so so if anyone's looking at it and saying, oh my god, there's so much freaking yellow. Uh, <laughs> I, the sky now is going to be blue. Okay. Um, and anyway, this and is there's the Butterfly no Garden. Until so you get the PPC and you can look at it and go, oh wow, look at this. Yeah, I know. So um, Butterfly Garden is a, this is the second edition. So I made a first edition a number of years ago. Um, and, oh, sorry, I didn't mean to keep moving that. My legs are getting tired sitting outside. <laughs> I, I, you know, the people who, who are just joining us should know that my power in my, in my house went out and I'm outside at a, at a local undisclosed location. That's right. Anyway. We've got Steve Finn here, who is all the way at some <laughs> undisclosed location, and we don't have the Steve, the name father, who doesn't have any power or internet. Oh, right, yeah. No, he and Luke and Kevin, he and uh, Kevin don't have any power, so we wish uh, the name father well. But uh, Bird is here. We're going to keep talking about the right. Butterfly Garden coming sure. out. Yeah. All right. August. So anyway, it's it, this is the second edition of a game, a uh, very light and breezy set collection game where you are again simultaneous. There's some simultaneous decision making here where everybody plays a card for turn order and the cards uh, have not only a, like an initiative number, but they have a variety of butterflies on them. And what you're trying to do kind of like splendor esque, you know, collect a set of things to earn the cards that are uh, displayed at the top. You'll see tarot sized cards. What, what you're doing is those are divided into four types. Uh, there's like an art museum, not an art museum. There's a natural history museum, a zoo, uh, a, uh, whatever, I don't know. There's two other things I'm blanking right now. I'm a little tired. And what you're, what the theme is you are saving butterflies from your local butterfly garden. That's being, uh, destroyed by, uh, cr construction projects. And so you're saving them and then bringing them to another butterfly garden where they'll live happily, you know, forever after. Um, sure. and so it's basically, there's a balance that the real tension comes in in this game is you are, if you play a low initiative card number, you don't get to put as many butterfly car butterflies in your jar. Oh. And so if you go later, you'll get more butterflies. It's kind of like if you spend more time in the field, you'll get more butterflies, but you don't get to get to the place quick enough. Right. Um, so, you know, I've used that mechanic in, in like sunset over water as well. Well, I guess this was first and then I, I kind of reused it in Sunset Over Water, the general idea. You play a low card and then you, but as you're collecting cards, you're also choosing cards based upon what butterflies, but also what initiative number they have. So if I play a low initiative number, I get to go now and I get to choose first again. Uh, and do I pick another low card so I can keep going first or do, but then I don't get a lot of butterflies that way. Or do I go and pick a, a you know, a, a, a later card and get more butterflies and you know there's some uh there's some special powers that allow you to do you know like a couple things based upon some of the cards have special powers, like you can swap a card out from your jar um you can someone is going to put a net out on the card you can move someone else's net to get the card you want you know little things like that but it's not this is not a heavy game at all um but again i i think it makes people think and you know it's still got that it's got my signature on it you know how long does it play 
how long does it take? It's two to five players, and I would say, you know, I'd probably say seven minutes per player. <laughs> Nina said so, that you, you've got a picture of the new box on your Facebook page, maybe? I do. Yeah, she said she saw it, and yes, the blue sky looks a lot better. Yes. Any questions, Verla? Butterfly Garden? I'm looking forward to seeing those cards up close. That artwork looks fantastic. Yeah, if you, uh, yeah. Beautiful no, work there. Yeah, yeah. Uh, on my Kickstarter video, uh, the intro video, I have a little panning shot that goes right up real close to them. You'll I'll have to wait to see that. All right, coming out August 24th, take a look for that Kickstarter. It's going to be in that all of the new 2021 releases for Dr. Finn's games. And check That's it out right. August yes. 24th. BJ from Morgan Gumbo, Verla and I have a special guest here tonight, Dr. Finn from Steve, <laughs> Steve Finn from Dr. Finn's game. <laughs> I knew I'd mess it up tonight. And we're going to talk about another spicy odd gaming that he's got coming out on Kickstarter August 24th. And this one's called Mining Colony. I think this is the one that Jesse and them uh, kind of played at Dice Tower Con. Do I have the right one? Jesse and John uh, Newman? Yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. There is. Yeah. Uh, it has, let me think what version that was. I don't know which version because I, so this game was originally in the Cosmic Run universe. Correct. So I have a series called Cosmic Run, um, but I decided to pull it out from there. And in the process of pulling it out, I changed the rules. Uh, sorry. It, I, I had a Kickstarter for it and it almost funded and it stopped short, you know, like a couple thousand short. So I decided to re rename it and also I changed it considerably from the Kickstarter. Uh, but they, yeah, they played the newer version because it, it, the Kickstarter originally only went one to two. It was a two player so game, I, I remember that. Yeah, you so I figured if I made it to a four player game, that would help help it. So tell, tell us about Mining Colony. So it's not it's not called Cosmic Run Mining Colony anymore. It's Mining Colony placed uh, up to four players. And if I remember, does, does, well, go ahead. You, you tell us about right. how. So, so the basic idea is uh, your planet is is losing a lot of resources. You need some stuff. So you go to a nearby planet and you're setting up a mining colony. And uh, it is a you know polynomial game, Tetris-like shapes. And what you're trying to do is you are uh, bidding. There's like a bidding board in the middle with resource zones. So there's sure. excavation zones that have the different resources up at the top. Everybody has a unique set of uh, bidding cards. Uh, for la they're called excavation cards, but for the lack of a better word, it's bidding. And you'll play one of them, and the lowest number gets to choose, you know, the resources first. And as you're collecting resources, you have to fit them on your board. Not only do you just have to have the places, uh, the the shapes fit, but the shapes have various characteristics on it where you can put certain kinds of items. And the way that you line up items is the way that you can score bonuses. Uh, just as one example, everybody's trying to build outposts. And the way you build an outpost is to have a, a ship and an astronaut of the same color, exactly one space apart within, with basically an, uh, an unmarked spot in between them. Oh, and like an empty space. when you can do that, you get to build an outpost. But the outposts are limited to one fewer than the number of players. So not everyone during the game is going to be able to build it. Um, so, I mean, that's just like one of the many things that you're trying to do. If you don't build an outpost, is that going to pretty much take you out of the running? No, no, not at all. Because oh. there's like there's there's uh, three different colors of outposts. And so in a four-player game, there's... Uh, you know, nine outposts. And then there's a similar thing. There's science stations that you're also trying to build. And they're only worth two points each. Whereas like the things that you're putting down are worth one. Um, if you don't build any at all of any of the colors, yeah, then you're not gonna, you're probably not gonna win. Right. But you'll also lose points at the end for not filling in your board. Uh, and also the cards, like at the end, whoever has the highest value of the cards remaining in their okay. hand scores a considerable number of points. Um, and there's some bonuses. Well, I have a, like a promo pack that has bonuses along the way. So if you don't build one of the outposts, uh -oh. you're probably okay. But if you don't build any of the outposts, you're probably going to be in trouble. Did we lose you? Yeah, yeah. Doc? No, okay. no, I'm, I'm back. Yeah, yeah. All right. So That's kind of so like saying, you know, in, Car in Carcassonne, if you never put a guy in a castle, 
you know, yeah. I don't know if you're going to win yeah, <laughs> or complete any castle. Right. Bro, you got any questions about money, Kali? I'm curious about the time. What you got? That is really cool looking. And that one goes to four or five? Four, one to four. That's a solo mode. Oh, solo mode. Oh, yeah. one to four. Ooh, solo yeah. players out there. Steve Finn taking care of you with that. Um, and Biblios uh, Quill and Parchment does as well. Oh, it also has a solo mode also? Yeah, 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 yeah. Interesting. Mining Colony. Uh, I like the polynomials. Um, you I have to like the coral orange. Oh, there's a lot of orange on this thing. Wow. Yes. Uh, where is and, our and, Christian Strain? He's going to love this game. There's so uh, much orange in there, man. <laughs> <laughs> He's going to love that. Mining no Colony. And that's coming up on Kickstarter uh, August 24th. It's going to be a package of all of the 2020 games for Dr. Finn's games. Isn't that right? 2021. 2021. 2021. Yep. Yeah, sorry. Yep. That's right. so your 2020 offerings for uh, for distribution, you know, for right. delivery in 2021. Yeah. Yes. So that is Mining Colony. Check that one out. BJ from Morgan Game Gumbo. I've got my guest here, Steve Finn from Dr. Finn's Games. And this is one, the other games that we talked about tonight, I knew a little bit about it, I did a little bit of research. This is one I missed. I don't know a lot about this one, but I know people in the Gateway and Filler Games group are really excited, and hopefully I'm pronouncing it right, about Nanga Parbat. I don't know how to pronounce it okay. myself. <laughs> okay, good. Well, Steve, tell us about Nanga Parbat, which I think is coming out on Kickstarter with a big group of your 2021 releases on August 24th, and I'm excited to hear about Nanga Parbat. Uh, all to, be, all to, be honest, uh, to be honest, this is the game to me of the four that I am like ecstatic about more than the other. I mean, uh, this, I mean, I'm happy about all my games, but I really like this game. Oh um, man, this with, is beautiful. Look at because this. Because uh, the, the artwork is uh, Aussie Haikala. I don't know how to say his last name. Uh, you know, I get to know these people. I'm always just like, hey, Aussie. You know, uh, mm -hmm. he's the one that did, you know, there's a game called Flamme Rouge. Oh, this is his art. Okay. That yeah. is his art. Really nice art. And the cover is just, I think he did such a good job. I mean, the whole, uh, all the other stuff and the graphic designer, I think, really did a good job. But anyway, the, this is a two player. All right. So, first of all, Nanga Parbat is the ninth tallest mountain range uh, in the world. Okay. And, and you are Sherpa people in this game who are climbing up the mountain and you are trapping animals uh, for their food and for clothing. And you're also setting up base camps uh, for hikers that are coming through, right? That's yeah, the think, theme. I think you've got your Kickstarter quote here. Dean Dunning says, yeah. Nanga Parbat is the quintessential Dr. Finn Games game. <laughs> I, I think it might be. I mean, it's it really has uh, a lot of the things that I try to have in a game. You know, a short playing time, a lot of thinky little decisions, but really, really easy rules. This is like a very simple game to play. Um, but there's one, a, a one lot of things going on. Right? Yeah, you know, it's one or two play. It's no, sorry, it's a two player game. Two players, okay. Yep. This is strictly two players. It's it's really at its game at its heart. It's an abstract game, but there's a lot of cute like animal meeples and stuff like that. So what what happens in this game is you you can see that it's made up of like a triangular mountain shape, right? So each the big triangle is broken up into six little triangles, and so each one of those triangles kinds of represents is like a microcosm of the whole. Okay. So that um, when I place when I make a placement in, in the board, so for example, if I'm in the lower right corner of the board, but then I pick the top space in that lower right corner, I send you to the top of the board. So the, the section that I pick inside of that region will determine where the next player goes. Oh. Um, and then when you go, you have like those six spots to choose from in that little section. And the one that you pick will then send me to that thing. So you have to be thinking about where am I going to send this other player? Exactly. If you know, this actually started, do you know that big tic-tac-toe game? Yeah, sure. The one at um, Cracker Barrel? Yeah. So it started where I said, I, I want to make that game, but I want to use, you know, where you're just basically like, I'm going to pick this lower right quadrant and I'm going to send you to the lower right. And then, you know, and then you're playing tic-tac-toe. So this actually started with that mm. rough idea. And then I discovered someone actually already had a game like that. So then I turned it into a, a oh. triangle. Yeah. 
Um, and then there's well, special, the animals have special you know? powers, all that stuff. What's that? How did, how did you tie it to Nanga Parbat? How did that come up? Well, what happened was That's I ended up changing it to triangles. And I said, and then I had this triangular, I did all sorts of different shapes. It was just an abstract game. And then I came up eventually with the triangle and I said, oh, this is cool. What is, what is the big triangle? And then I said, what can that be? And then it's like, oh, it could be a mountain. And then I said, all right, it's a mountain. <laughs> what, Everest what could, and K2 are what could the resources be? And then that was the tricky part. Cause I'm like, what kind of resources are there at the top of a mountain? So thematically it gets a little loose because there's these animals living up at the top of the mountain, but are there there, chances bottles? are they're probably not going to be there. No oxygen bottles. No, no oxygen bottles. Yeah. <laughs> so I, I told the artist, make sure that the, the board, like the top of the board, isn't actually the top of the mountain. <laughs> and so he didn't, he doesn't have the, the mountain all the way at the top, but it to still the has the, it still has all the animals living in the snow, but regardless, that's, you know, that's like where the theme kind of breaks down. But that's how I ended up picking the theme. And then once I picked the theme and then I decided on different animals, then all of a sudden, like the game really opened up because I just said, oh, you know what? These different animals can have different powers. Oh. And then that's all. And then you could see the main player's boards. What happens is when you collect an animal, you put it at the top half of the board and you could see if, if you're looking at it, there's arrows pointing down. Sure. I'll what you it. do is you slide it to the bottom of the board to activate it. So you can start piling up all of these animals and then on your turn, you can use as many of them as you want. Yes. And you can just start comboing all these different things. And then, but then at some point you also want to trade them in to score points. And there's like a, uh, a scoreboard in the upper left, but they are, it's if one person scores a certain set of animals, like if I score five different animals, you can't score five different animals. So there's this trade off you have to make between do I want to save the animals to use their powers or do I want to quickly turn them in and get the points before the other player does? So the, w when you're using the animals, can you use the animal special powers and then also score them? Yes. Or is yes. that a, oh, so you don't have to decide between the two. Okay. Right. You can trade them in too before you use them, but then they're gone. Then they're gone. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, I, I love that when you can pile up all these things and, and put them in reserve, oh, yeah. got the special actions and then you get to decide how right. many of those special actions? Aquatica has that, and that's one of the reasons why I like Aquatica so much. Two-player game. Uh, so the blue and pink are competing for each other on the spots on the board, but they each have their own board, it looks like, for doing the special actions. But, yeah, that's just to keep track of the animals. Okay, keep it track yeah. of the animals. How long did you Go ahead. You put there? Wait, say it again, Verla. What animals did you put on there? All right, here. I have their names. So oh. I, I actually have a copy of the game right here. But so I'll I'll tell you the, the names of the animals. You know it would have been awesome, Berla, if he had got somebody over there at that undisclosed location to just jump in and play a game randomly. That would have been fun. <laughs> hey, we need you to play. Just turn to the side. <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'll just say this. I'm completely alone in this parking lot and sitting on the street. You and the uh, mosquitoes. Uh, yeah, no, right. I am going to suffer tonight. It's scratching. Uh -huh. All right. I've got a snow leopard, which is white. So okay. I actually matched the colors of the animals with... <laughs> With their basic color, with with basically what they are. Nicely I have done. a tar, a T A H R. I don't know that one. A musk deer, which is gray. A yak, which is black. A nice. baral, B H A R A L. Never heard I don't of that. Know that one. Which is also blue. This is blue, but it actually has like a bluish hue. The the actual piece is more blue. And then a red panda. Oh, a, cu okay. a cute little red panda. Um, I love the, yeah. the panda looks a little bit like a squirrel. And that is yes. Nanga Parbot, a two-player yes. game from Dr. Finn's Games. It's part of a big package of Kickstarter games he's got coming out Tuesday, August Tuesday, August twenty-fourth. That's a Monday. Monday. I almost, I uh, yeah, I almost always launch. No, did, yeah, I almost always launch on a Monday. Man, when I think of Kickstarters, I think of Tuesdays, and you're doing yours on Mondays. Interesting. I always do mine on a Monday. You you know, uh, yeah, I do that because I think a lot of people, I don't know if this is true or not, could be just completely in my mind, but a lot of people go back to work. They're like, shit, I don't, don't want to be here. And then, sorry, I didn't mean a vulgarity. Uh, damn, I don't want to be here. <laughs> and they like to start I don't looking think we heard it. stuff to do. <laughs> <laughs> Monday afternoon, so, you've got the munchies. You're, 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 you're trying to find you someone. Oh, my God, it's a no one week. wants to work on Monday. Right. Let me just click on Kickstarter. Yeah. What you said, bro? 
You've got the Monday blues, so you need to back a new game. Exactly. And, four and new games. You have to back four new games. Sure. Yeah. All right. So, you know, we didn't talk about that before, so might as well talk about it with Nanga Parbat. You can buy any one of the four games. Yeah. So the I, package of the even, four, right? Yeah. Even though the games are going to have slightly different values um, in the real world, I had to make the Kickstarter easy. So it's just something like this. It's like 24 for one, 44 for two, 60 whatever for three, and then 75 for four. And then I'm thinking of having like 130 for two of each for your friends. You know, like if you, if two people who live near each other both want to get in together and then do that. So there might be a, might be the, a level like that. That reminds me, Dan wanted to know, are you ever going to do a second edition of it? Let them eat shrimp. Uh, will I? It's can possible. You, you I, can neither I, confirm I, nor deny. Well, no, if I do it, I, I have no problem talking about the games that I'm going to be doing when I'm, so I've, I've now have some contracts with other publishers right. and I don't give, I don't have permission to speak about those are <laughs> let them eat shrimp is not one of those. So it would be one of those I'm thinking of. Sure. I am I, I, right now it's between gun runners for, for my 2022 line. I'm trying to decide whether I should do gun runners over or let them eat shrimp. Oh, Verla, we got a little, a little scoop there. Yeah. Uh, Insight into Dr. Finn's games, Gun Runners, yeah. or Let Them Eat Shrimp. All right, Dan. So keep an eye out for the 2022 line. It might be Let Them Eat Shrimp. All right. So that's Nanga Parbat, August 24th. It's on a Monday. It's going to be in a big package of games. Make sure you support Dr. Finn's games. Get all four of those for 75 bucks, which is going to include uh, Butterfly Garden, Mining Colony, Nanga Parbat, and Biblios Quill and Parchment. When is expected fulfillment on these next year? I'm saying March. March? It's probably going to be February, but I throw in one extra month. No, Under course. promise and over deliver, right? Exactly. Yeah, uh, I've I've had 23 Kickstarter campaigns. Uh, one I stopped, one didn't make it, but of the 22, I was late once by a month. Oh. All right. Well, that's not going to happen in this one. So. Yeah. Check it out. Two, Monday, August 24th, big Kickstarter for Dr. Finn's games. This is a board game show, Steve, so we got to play a game, right? I'm ready. You got time for a quick game? Good. How's your battery? I'm at 28%. I wish the name father was here, Berlin. Man, <laughs> where is – he's only got 28%, so we got to roll. We're going to play a All game right. we like to call Just One Medium. Have you played either either Just One or Medium? No. Great little, great little party game, filler games. Do you have access to the host chat? On your computer? Me? Yeah. In that upper right-hand corner? Uh, yes. All right, good. So click on the host chat. Yep. And this is the way it's going to work. I've got some random cards, right, Verla? Totally random, just drawn right out of the, just drew them right out of the deck. And I'm going to give privately the two clues to me, you, and Verla. We're going to try to come up with something, a word that connects the two it, they call it the medium between the two, right? So if it's baseball and a catcher, maybe maybe it's bat, right? Something that connects the two, you know, something okay. like that. Sure. So here's, here's the trick: we're gonna we're gonna score points. <clears throat> Berla, can you keep track of the points for me? Yes. All right. uh, we're gonna score points based on if the if the chat crew guesses our one, but if any of the three of us come up with the same word, then our words are knocked out and only the other player gets to score points. So you're trying to think of the media, uh, but without it. being so obvious that, or maybe you go obvious because you think everybody else is not going to go obvious. So, right. so what happens if we, if all three of us have a different word? We're not, oh, all three of us have a different word. Then we throw it out. You know, we say, we, we tell the chat crew what the two words are, and then they're trying to guess what, what words we picked. So oh, okay, got case, it. You might say right. that, Verla might say umpire, and I might say me. I got it, I got it. And you're gonna say you're gonna tell everybody these are the three, but you don't say who. Yes, yes. Well, what I'm gonna do, I won't even say them. The chat crew's gonna try to guess. And so oh. if they match one yeah. of them, okay. you get a point. If they don't match, you don't get a point. All right. So you feel like right. you got, got it? it? We're gonna run through yeah, this I, real quick. Yeah, get I onto the so. host chat, and I'm yep. going to type the words up. Oh, wait, we actually just give the clues out, right? So don't look at what the chat crew is doing. 
Just look at the host right. chat. I'm going to actually say the two words, and then we're going to think in terms of what that is, and then we'll put our word in, okay? So the first and one gonna, is... I'm going to type it into the host chat chat box. Yeah, don't look in the public okay. chat. Look in the host yep, chat. I'm not looking right. in the public. Yep. All got right, it. so here we go. The, uh, the clues are mermaid and male. All right, so I've got mine. Mermaid and male, M-A-L-E. Mermaid and male. So just tell me when you're ready, and then we'll go one, two, three, and we'll both we'll all three type them in at the same time. Mermaid and male. I've got one. Verla, what you thinking? You got something? What's that? I've got one. I might get knocked out, but. Steve, you got one? You said mermaid and male. Yeah. Uh, uh, yes. All right, <laughs> here we go. One, Wait, two. Wait, do I type in? One, two, three. Type it in. Here we go. All right, so chat crew, we got, oh, okay, good. So we got three <laughs> different ones. Yeah, so Steve, we went with the good one there. I didn't want to go that way because I was like, somebody's going to put that one in. Well, All I right, didn't say merman. Oh, I, I think you got it. Marshall Marshall, Marshall matches up with Steve. He had merman. I think that's close enough. Don't you think, uh, don't you think, uh, Verla? He had merhuman. I think that's close enough. Yeah. Aquaman, no, that's not it, Thomas. Any other guesses? Any other guesses? I think uh, Verla... <laughs> Derek Zoolander. Okay, that's an interesting <laughs> one. <laughs> uh, looks like no one else has any guesses. Let's see. So, Verla, okay. Verla, what did you have for yours? Uh, mine was Triton. Triton. There's a male mermaid, right? And mine yeah. was Eric. I was trying to connect male and you know Prince Eric and the mermaid tail. So, we'll see from the movie from the Disney's A Little Mermaid. All right. So, do you, you understand how we play it? I just made up. Well, yeah, I guess I do. Know. Wait, do I win? Because I was, if I had said merman, would that have been good, better? I would have had a match. I'm going to give you a match. Merman, merhuman, that's close enough. So. I said merhuman because I was trying not to say merman. Yeah, I think that's close enough. Don't you think? Right. I'll give him one. All right. So Steve is winning the game. These are totally random. I didn't actually All just right. set up this for the game. So here we go. Ready? Yes. Next clue is spaghetti and sandwich. Spaghetti and sandwich. Can I, can it, all right, this might, can it be a, does it have to be one word? No, no, no. The just one part is that only one person can use it. So just one, because in medium, you can use a little phrase. So if you got a phrase, that's fine. Spaghetti and sandwich chat room. We're not looking, we're over in the host chat right now, so we can't see it. Um, okay. Let me think, let me think. okay, I got mine. Everybody got it? Three, two, one. Oh, yes. So all three of us are good, chat chat crew. Here's your chance. What do we got here? Um, let's see. Do we have any? Oh, man, Thomas, I was thinking of that one. Did anybody say that one? No. I almost went with meatball. You know, anybody else have a guess? Spaghetti and sandwich out there, chat crew. Come on. Somebody match up with ours. <laughs> Kelly's got Subway. No. Dean's got meatball. Hmm. Marshall, you got a guess? Anybody? Dan? Man, nope. They're, they're not guessing here. I guess we stumped them. All right. I'm going to call it. Steve, what'd you say for spaghetti and meatball? I mean, chicken spaghetti parmesan. and sandwich. Chicken parmesan. Chicken parm. I like that. I like that. Verla? I had baguette. Baguette. And I had sloppy joes. Spaghetti. It's, it's basically a spaghetti sandwich, right? Just doesn't have go. the noodles. All right. Back to the host chat. Let's try. Nobody scored a point on that one. I don't think. No matches. Nope. Ramen ramen bun. I don't know that. Yeah, interesting. I got it, Marshall. Now I figured it out. All right, here we go. Totally random ones. I did not pre-plan these at all. Uh New York and athlete. New York and <laughs> athlete. Okay, maybe I did set these up, Steve. <laughs> New York and athlete. What do we have? Let's see. I don't I don't pay attention to sports. New York and athlete. Yeah, but you are in New York, so I know oh, you I understand. the closer the Daily News or the Times. Or yeah, I'm, not, yeah, yeah. I'm not familiar with all the newspapers there, but sure, hopefully. I got something. All right, let me see. New York and athlete. Um, I got. Um, all right, I got it. Ready? Three, two, one. Type it in. I like Berla's. Yeah. Okay. I I figured you would say that, so I stayed away from that one. <clears throat> all right. Here we go. Now, chat crew, you got to have some of those. Oh, Kelly, that would have been a good one. Lady in the Tramp, spaghetti sandwich. That is a good one. Uh, uh, yes. 
Look at the there points go. rolling in. Look at the <laughs> points rolling in. The king of New York, Derek Jeter. Give me that point, Berla. I'm giving it to you, BJ. Anybody he else? He's not in New York anymore, is he? He's in Miami now, but what still. The he's, he's the eternal captain. He's All the right. forever captain. All right. Do, are you guys going to score any points? I don't see it. Any other guesses besides Derek Jeter? Anybody out there? Well, Verla, keep an eye on the chat, and we'll we'll score right. up the points if anybody Wait. else. Oh. No, no. Right. Exactly, Dean. Cheater yeah, makes he... sense. <laughs> All right, here we go. Next one. Totally random. Never heard of these before. Let's go. Oh, let me turn off the host chat, public chat there. Here we go. Ready? Egg and sugar. Egg and sugar. I have one right away. I have one right away. Anybody that knows me is going to get this one. You two will never get it, I don't think. No. Uh, if Dave were in the chat, he would get this one right away. Egg and sugar. Oh, yeah. I'll type mine in. I know exactly what it is. So you just give me a nod or a smile when you think uh, you got it. I, I, I don't. I mean, I have something, but it's not. I don't. It's not good. Early, you it's got a good coming. one? I've got one. I think it's good. All right. All right. Three. Who's going to get it? Wait, 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 wait. Egg and what was it? Sugar, Sugar and egg. No, I don't have anything good. Okay. All right. Three, yeah. two, one. Hit send. Ooh. Oh, good one, Verla. Oh, I like that. Wait, are there eggs in that? Yeah. I'm going to trust you. I'm going to trust you. Yeah. Oh, there we go. Oh, that's cheating, though. Oh, you guys probably eat it together. All right, so Kelly scores with Verla. She knows oh, that's my Dean, I should have thought of that one. Why didn't I go with Oh, I was going to go. Oh, that's uh Ben that's Gate what I said. and King Cake. Marshall, how did you not get mine? Come on, Marshall, you let me down. What does your grandmother make every morning? Come on. Pat Padze, which I think you all call Pan Perdu. I'm not sure how to, how to pronounce it. Other than, does anybody know what it's French toast basically? But yeah. do you all know French toast? No, that cake is was a, my first cake, was my first thought. Marshall, how did you not get Pat Padzu? Come on, man. Come on from Louisiana. Didn't even get that. All right. So I did not score any points, but it looks like um, Kelly and Verla matched up. All right. So that's Back. a point for us right now. That, that's I points. think it's two to one to one. Yep. Who's got the two? You. Oh, okay. um, no. I've Got yeah, because he got two Derek Cheaters. Yeah, it's only one point. Yeah, only one point. Oh, it's only one point. Oh, I oh. thought you got a point for each. each no, no, no. All right, here we go. Oh, okay. Another totally random one. Not yep. not thinking about the guest at all, Berla. <laughs> Are you ready? Frisbee yeah. and lawn. <laughs> now, what are you going to put for that, Steve? Because you know what I'm thinking. I know what I'm putting. <laughs> you can't take it. I'm not I already called it. <laughs> got it. Um, I want right, to go ahead. I want to score a point, but um, I'm going to let you have it because I know what you're going to put. No, you don't know what I'm going to put. Oh, really? Okay. Well, uh, I'm, gonna, I'm going with mine then. I'm all ready. right. Well, we'll see. See if we say the same thing. All right, Berla, you got one. I'm ready. Three, ready. two, one. Oh, okay. Good. All right. Good. All right. So, well, that's interesting. I don't know what this is. Well, Berla's is, is an alternative name. Mm -hmm. Very smart. Very smart. Uh, are we going to give Thomas a match? There we go. Yeah, we're talking. Well, Kelly's got the direct match. Okay, nicely done. Disc golf. Okay. I think I, – oh, back on that other one, Alora was the one who suggested it. So, uh, Kelly, you got to tell your sister. Congrats on that one. Uh, so, disc golf and Thomas has golf. I think that's a close enough match there. Come on, somebody, somebody's got to get mine. Come on. Oh, what? Why do we even know this word? How are how are they getting this? Yeah. Okay. It, what, it, what is this word? I'll just say that frisbee golf. Yeah, this is what people who golf. don't understand disc golf call it. Mm -hmm. Because we yeah. don't play with frisbees. Right. You play with discs. With, yeah, but they're not made by Frisbee. Frisbee is a, a brand name. Ah, oh, by Wemo. We play with yeah. craft discs. Mm, Frisbee is a brand name. Of it. And also Ultimate Frisbee is not Ultimate Frisbee. It's just called Ultimate. <laughs> so, that's um, what I typed. Hey, I yeah, had that's, that's, That is there. what you, you typed. It's true. Yeah, so mm -hmm. uh, that's one thing about. Right there. 
Dean, I don't get the reference. Get my freeze on. Oh, I totally get it. I love it. I mean, I know it's the office, but I don't it's, remember. Is that, uh, no, isn't, isn't it? Um, no, it's uh, Parks and Recreation. No, isn't Michael it? Scott. Michael Scott's the office. I must oh, have, really? I must have missed oh. that episode. Do they play Frisbee golf or something? Do they play disc golf? No, not really, but he's acting like he wants to go hang out with the cool guy so he can go get his frizz on. Oh, it's oh, it's Michael Scott. Oh, I didn't see the word Michael Scott. Yeah, 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 yeah. But they also, there's a lot of references in um, Parks and Recreation. I'm waiting for the really good disc, disc golf, golf game. I have not seen it yet. So waiting for the Dr. Finn's games um, disc golf game. Okay, here we go. Ready for there's that? There's actually a disc golf game out there. Is there? Yes, there is a disc golf board game. Hmm. I'll have to check that out. <laughs> All right. We only got a few left. You got time for a couple more? Uh, 12%. Okay, good. Ooh, we got to go fast then. Hook, Hook and London. Hook and London. And London. Burla, you know where I'm going with that. Come on. Be careful. Tread carefully, Burla. Yeah, yeah, I know exactly where. Shoot. How am I going to get this and not get the same? Taking it from you because I know you know where I'm going with that. There's plenty of other options. You can move to this. You can switch lanes. <laughs> That's where my mind went into. Do you know what me and Verla are talking about? I have no idea. Hook and London. Hook and London. I'm not even looking at the public chat, but I'm sure there's a bunch of people just screaming at us right now. Hook and uh, London. Do you have one? Uh, do I have to have one? <laughs> <laughs> you got to have one. Verla, you got one? Yeah. All right. There we go. All right, three, two, one, punch it in. Oh, good job, good job. Hey, look, yeah, all three are good. Okay, so you didn't know what we were talking about then, Steve? Uh, yeah, kind no? of. Kind of. Well, I mean, I know, I know, yeah, generally speaking, but I didn't know London was necessarily associated. So that the story is set, it's um, uh, J.M. Barry that wrote it, and it was set in London, and they fly okay. over the Tower of London, the city. Yeah. Uh, that is Peter Pan. So that's two there. Yeah, uh, I, I don't even know Peter Pan. I mean, I know what I never actually saw or heard. Peter Pan was not part of my life. Oh, shoot. Nin In any way. 1953, Disney animated movie. Excellent. Never Excellent. never saw it. Yeah. Great songs. The best old Disney movie. <laughs> oh, I remember now. He goes to when uh, Ryan was uh, the business class and he, and he just, he yeah. totally turns off all the people in the classroom. I do remember that. Yeah. Okay. All right. So I do. Okay, so who said? I did Pan? score one on that one for Peter Pan. I don't think anybody else scored one. All right, here we go. Let's do. You know what? Let's do one more. How's that? We'll call it. I got ten percent. Oh yeah, we get this is the last one. Last mm -hmm. one. Last, we're running out of time here. All right, ready for the last one? Yep. Grandma and soup. Grandma, Grandma. and soup. We should have. We're from three different areas of the country. We should have three different guesses, right? This is the traditional ending clue, Verla, so stay away from mine. Gumbo up, uh, Grandma. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> Come on. Uh, might as well plug it in. Yep. <laughs> the traditional ending ending one. Oh, Marshall, I like that one for the last one. Fish and chips. That would have been that would have been a good one. Hook. Think about a hook and London, right? Fish and chips. That's pretty good. That was pretty good. All right, so we got uh, Steve's in. I'm in. Verla, we just need yours. Working on it. But they can't spell. Hold on. And it is grandma and soup. Grandma go. and soup. All right, here we go. Let's see what we got here. Chicken noodle. Yeah, interesting. Marshall, I am taking away your Louisiana card. <laughs> I'm totally taking it away. You're killing me. Dumplings. By, by, by the way, my wife loves dumplings. So, um, I'll take a point for that. Oh, do you have yours? I have chicken. Oh, he does. Yeah, chicken noodle, chicken noodle soup. I'll give you that one. Dean, is chili a soup, Dean? I'm calling shenanigans. <laughs> now, Dean, if you were, you know, if you're on the show, you would say, "Well, gumbo is not really a soup. It's a broth, right?" I think uh, it's a very hearty, meaty broth. But all right, so Verla, give us a score. How do we do? All righty. So BJ had two. Steve has three, and I have one. Oh. Steve is the winner of the, of the Just One Medium Game. Congratulations, Steve. That is Game Time presented by Game Toppers LLC. Make your game nights, Steve, a showstopper when you play on a Game Topper.
Just one medium. And Stephen is the big winner of Just One Medium. All right, yeah. board gamers, that is it for another show. That's it for another episode of Gumbo Live. Doc, how can people reach you if they want to know more about this Kickstarter or they want to just talk to you about some of the games? Anybody can go to drfins.com, and then there's a contact tab. You can just go there, check out my site, hit contact, and then it's got uh, a way to reach me there. Dr. Finn's Games has a big Kickstarter August 24th. That's a Monday. He's got all four of those games, uh, and you can get the bundle package and support Dr. Finn's Games by getting all four of them, and they'll be delivered hopefully by March, maybe even sooner, right? Yes. Well, you're always welcome on the show. Make sure to like our Facebook page, facebook.com slash boardgamegomo, and our YouTube channel. It helps us get the word out about all of our upcoming shows, including, Steve, we're going to have Grant Rodiak and Patrick Leader from Leader Games. They're going nice. to be talking about a game called Fort. Uh, it's a reimagining of SPQF, uh, kind of his take, not his take, but it's kind of an homage to Glory to Rome and all those really crunchy combo uh, multi-use card type of games. So, But it's got an interesting mechanic that I think you might like. You, you have cards, and if you don't play them, other people can grab your friends and bring them to their fort. So you got to uh. be careful. You can't just hoard your friends there. And that's the way life is, right? When you're when the schoolyard, you got you to gotta share and share alike. So that's Grant Rodiak and Patrick Leader next week. I'm BJ from Board Game Gumbo. And until next time, Berla and Steve, thank you all for coming on. Lazy Le Bon Temps Roulette.